Paul, uh, welcome to to our webinar here. It was originally scheduled uh, exclusively for our travel ball players and families. Apparently, the 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 folks behind the scenes uh, have decided it was uh, worth opening to others. And we've got some amazing special guests with us from all over the country, uh, as far as Seattle, Washington. Uh, Devin Morgan, the director of uh, youth baseball at Driveline Academy, the founder of Driveline Academy, will be here with us tonight. Jeff McGarry, the senior manager of, they call it customer success, I call it player and athlete success, is with us. So welcome to the lab at uh, at the arena here at New York Empire Baseball. Uh, like I said, originally scheduled for uh, information to our travel ball players, teams, and families, but now open to the world. Um, excited to share all this stuff with you. So let's jump right in. Um we're just a very, very short agenda tonight, but we're going to get pretty in depth on, on a few key topics here. Uh, first, we're going to to jump in on a, a, just a quick update on player development and player development scorecards and the program that we launched over the winter here. Kind of hard to believe, sorry for the, the hackneyed comment here, but hard to believe that it's March and we are weeks away from opening day. Uh, not really worried about MLB opening day. Uh, weeks away from youth baseball opening day here in New York. Half the rest of the country is already playing baseball. Uh, we're waiting for the the rain, forty degree rain, and and snow to clear out. Um, but we're going to take a, a a very serious look at what we've learned over the last couple of months. From there, we'll jump into the common themes and questions and next steps in the player development program. Uh, the reason I say common themes is when we went out to all one hundred and sixty five ball players in the travel organization and their families, spoke to each and every one of you. And there were certainly some common themes and the questions you had and and thoughts and feedback to share, which was fantastic in continuing to evolve our own player development program. So thrilled to be sharing some of that as well. And certainly next steps in, in our player development. You'll hear from uh, Jeff McGarry, uh, again, Senior Manager of Athlete and Player Success at Blast Motion and the Director of Youth Baseball at Driveline Academy, the founder of Driveline Academy, Devin Morgan. Uh, excited to have them both here. Thank you both for being with us. Uh, from there, we'll jump into our approach to, to player development and competition, right? I think, and you, we'll talk about this a little later, but I think far too often uh, when somebody says a program is developmental, it sounds like an excuse for not winning more baseball games. And as Devin will share, and certainly we're going to talk about, that is absolutely not the case. Player development and competition or competitiveness are not mutually exclusive. Instead, if you take a long-term approach, they are very much go hand in hand. You want to win long-term and develop long-term and play baseball at a high level for a long period of time, player development is where it's at. Uh, finally, uh, we'll go into some more specific uh, New York Empire baseball stuff, just some team and season logistics, with the caveat that we're not only going to talk about logistics and schedules and tournaments, we're also going to talk some uh, about some very, very important topics around what a player is doing during the game, what we're thinking about during the game, what our approach to in-game performance is and how we coach it. And what parents should be doing during the baseball game probably can guess what we're going to say there. So again, let's jump right in from uh, here in the lab at uh, the arena here at New York Empire Baseball. So let, let's talk quickly about some things that we learned and, and some of them are kind of obvious. And in, in case I didn't inter introduce them already or you don't know them, uh, Jake Berry, manager of travel baseball here at New York Empire Baseball is with me. He'll be joined shortly by uh, Chris Carano, who I think most of you know. If you don't, you will certainly get to know him tonight and over the next few months. He's been at the organization for seven years now. Uh, Jake, are you on four, three? Two and change. Almost three. What a time flies when you're having fun. Um, or when you're eating Greek food yeah. <laughs> before a webinar. Um, so let's let's talk about some of the some of the things we learned and and some of them are not groundbreaking or earth shattering right what we what we really gained out of this the the this new approach to player development um was to even more if we could say hyper individualize our training programs and the reason Jake is is nodding his head here is because he is at the spearhead of those programs and instead of having generalized practice plans for our travel program 12 teams 165 ball players are now individualized in their training all the way down to the practice level, not just the homework that we were given, but very quickly as we started to see what was coming out of 
the training programs, what we got from some of the driveline driven data and driveline driven programming, and certainly out of the, the metrics we saw at Blast Motion among the other technologies that we use here was how we could individualize not just the homework that we send, but we could individualize, thanks to Jake and all the work that his team did, we could individualize the team practices. So there were things that teams needed uniquely. There were things that players on teams needed in smaller buckets so we could localize and be as, as focused as an organization could possibly be on every player within every team in the organization. 12 teams, 165 ball players, all saw programming, practice, training, development, in-house work, homework that was individualized for them. And that came very, very rapidly uh, thanks to the work the team did and all of the, the information that we saw and the feedback that we got from all of you. So that was very exciting. Uh, one of the strange things that came out of that was also our having reached back to so many of our teams and families to say, listen, we love being here for every player all the time. Um, obviously having as many coaches as we do uh, dedicated to every practice and many instructors as we do dedicated to every team practice, we wanted to maintain that that focus on the individual teams and on the individual players. The downside of that might have been that we asked all of you to stop coming to practices that weren't for your team. And the reason for that was we wanted to give every team and every individual player the attention that we created, the, the, the focus and the training that we created for them and the attention they deserve within that environment. So instead of suddenly having 18 or 19 players in one practice, we want to keep it at the 12 or 13 or 14 that your team has on it so that the coaches could be focused on the program that's been created for each individual team, for each individual player on that team. So while it reduced a little bit of the, I, I guess, convenience that we, we've offered for so many years just by being here and always being open and welcoming, we're still open, we're still welcoming. But I could tell you that recently, someone who just turned eight, showed up at a 10 year practice where they're having live ABs. And I can tell you one of our 10 year olds throwing 60 some odd miles an hour, Devin Morgan, if I were wearing a cap, I'd tip it to you. We appreciate all that driveline has done as a, a leader in, in youth baseball. And certainly what we've learned from you has been instrumental in all of that. Um, but having a, a child who's seven years old, just turning eight facing 60 plus, it sounds like fun. It might be unsafe or inappropriate at that moment for that particular player not what we want to move forward with and certainly not the the focus that our 10 year olds need to go in and and be prepared and confident for what is just 30 days away from today so it, it's not a matter of us wanting to create unimportant rules or or be inconvenient it's maintaining that level of focus and training for every player every team in the organization so i hope you all understand that uh, i think it was an important change that that we made to the program because it allowed us to give everyone what they deserve um I can tell you, and I'm going to steal Jake's thunder out from under him. I'm sorry. Uh, Jake is releasing uh, abridged and updated player development scorecards at the end of March. This time around, they're going to be very, very focused again on each individual player and what we've learned, where are the opportunities for continued development, what are the strengths, where have we seen some incredible uh, gains, and we'll talk more about that with Jeff and Devin, but I can tell you that our an analytics team, which is now headed by uh, A.J. Farrar, formerly of the New York Mets, who is now managing uh, what we call the art department, uh, analytics, uh, research, and technology. Um, really excited to share, and this will come as no surprise, nothing mind-blowing here. The players who train the most at home, particularly with Blast Motion and their at-home uh, uh, training programs that are up there on driveline track, saw the most success and improvement. The percentage gains, and it works both ways. The players that trained the most gained the most, and the players that gained the most, it was clear, we looked back, trained the most. No surprise there, right? What we want to do is make sure that everyone is seeing those gains, and if we need to help, this is not the usual, hey, look, we've got this bell curve of interaction. There's this leading tail of players who put in the work, and they're seeing the most success. That's true. It doesn't mean we want to cut off the rest of the curve and the rest of our players because 16 players are really going all out and 149, there's this sort of difference in behavior. We want to help and ensure the success of every player in the organization. It behooves us for every player in this organization to get better. So if you have other priorities in life, if 
you have other demands on your time, you have tutors, you have family needs that are important. There's no question about those things. But if you can make some time for it, come back to us, say, listen, it was too much for me, but I need help. We're here for you. This is not, if you're not in the top 10%, head of the bell curve, ha, huh, you deserve to fail. Nope, we are going to do everything that we can. And I know the other folks on this call from outside of organization are so committed to the success of every player in our organization, not just in travel ball, but throughout. But the 165 players and families who are on this call right now and are in our travel program, we are looking to guarantee your success with one catch. If you're not willing to come forward and not willing to do any work, it's not going to work out for you. And we'll talk more about that. We want to do everything we can to do exactly what it says here. We want to empower every player. I don't care if you are six and a half years old. We want to empower you to own your development no matter what age you are. We're going to help you advocate for yourself amongst the coaches. You want to play a position? Don't go home to mom and say, I want to play shortstop. Come to your coach. I know it could be scary. I know it can be sort of overwhelming and you're nervous. Don't be. We are not your judges ever. We are not here to judge you. Our coaching staff 20 deep is your fan club. Every step of the way, we're here for you. We want you, whether you're six, seven years old, 14, 15 years old, whatever you are, we are here for you. And if you need something changed or you need help doing something, you come to us, right? It's one of the reasons why we're so focused on the at-home training kits that are out now with everything from Tidal Tank and some of our other training tool partners and certainly Blast Motion. The tools for development are now in the hands of each and every player in this organization, regardless of their age. You have them. If you don't yet, if you don't have your training kit, we went back to every one of our vendors, asked for some pretty deep discounts to make sure that these things would be in your hands without worry about what it costs. If you haven't yet ordered your at-home training kit, go ahead, reach out, obviously, to Jill and the team and get that, right? It'll be waiting for you here. Everything is now here in the arena. Um, the other thing I do have to point out, otherwise Jill will kick my butt, is that uh, whether it's Marucci or Easton with the Hype Fire, Marucci with the Cat X, uh, Wilson, Rawlings, whatever, baseball gloves, we do hope that you already realize there is no place on earth that sells this stuff cheaper than New York Empire Baseball. Guaranteed. I know that sounds like a retail sales pitch. Everything that's in the arena is sold cheaper because you're a part of New York Empire Baseball. We don't advertise it online. It's not for sale outside of here. But if you're a New York Empire Baseball ball player, you are paying less than retail, less than Amazon, less than any discount for anything that you buy here, whether it's $20 or $335, it is cheaper here. So if you need something, reach out to your coach. Um, it's likely already here in the arena. Back to what's important on the development side. Like I said, the tools for development are in your hands. Um, with that, I want to introduce uh, Jeff McGarry. Um, he is, like I said, I have renamed his title. I think uh, his company calls him the senior manager of customer success. Um, his customers, the coolest people in the world, they are you, um, our ball players. His responsibility at Blast Motion is to make sure that ball players get better using Blast Motion. It's a great job. He doesn't have to sell anything. He doesn't have to call anybody other than to say, how can we help you to get better at baseball? And I talk to him regularly. Our teams talk regularly to make sure that we're all in line. So um, let's see, how do we add, Jeff, can you, oh, I'll unmute you. Oh, you unmute. You Jeff McGarry, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I can tell you now, um, we love you and we love what you do for the organization. So the floor is yours. Appreciate it very much, Jordan. So like Jordan mentioned, I kind of do like your title a little bit better than uh, manager of the customer success team at Blast, but I manage a team of four and our responsibility is to provide a service to our, our amateur customer base. So we work directly with everybody from the college market and down. Um, before I get into that, just a little bit about myself. I grew up in South Jersey, outside of Philadelphia. I played at the University of Pennsylvania from 2011 to 2015. Uh, was a pitcher and an infielder, first and third baseman, and a starter at uh, each of those positions. So I had a really fun career there and um, stumbled upon a job on LinkedIn for Blast Motion one day, you know, back in 2018, that was. Or, or And then, of course, in my college career, I wasn't too familiar with what technology was available and I'd never heard of Blast, but really was lucky enough to uh, 
stumble upon this job. And I've been in a number of different roles here on the sales side and now over on the on the service side. So um, again, getting back to my team and myself, uh, currently we work with 600 organizations across the country. I myself, including those 600 and, and the others that I've worked with over the years are probably up to close to about a thousand organizations. Again, all on the amateur side, I get a little bit of exposure to the MLB. We have a whole team internally that deals with those guys. But um, let me just say uh, the partnership that we have with New York Empire Baseball and their commitment to player development and their use, their implementation and and use and approach to technology on the player development side. I mean, of those thousand, uh, I can tell you I have not worked with a single organization that does it as well as these guys. And, you know, if I could name one that does, I would say like, you know, New York Mets, San Diego Padres, Philadelphia Phillies. And, you know, I'm, I'm not blowing smoke here. That's, that's legit. Um, they've got every single one of their coaches is, is blast certified. Um, that's a big thing that we try to do as a customer success team is make sure the coaches know our terminology, our metrics, how to use them, how to apply them. And, I mean, they do it up and down. They do it for the guys that are going to college and they do it for that six and a half, that seven-year-old, that nine, 10, everybody. And, you know, it's just from having such a long and developed partnership with these guys and and from them asking questions over the years. So you know that no matter what age your son or, or, or daughter is, that if you're working with an instructor in your empire, they know and understand, hey, how can we take everything that we're capturing, everything the bat's doing, everything the body's doing, everything that you're getting hooked up to, everything the ball's doing and how do we make that relevant? Um, and how do we gain insights for this player of, of you know, this age? Because obviously what a 16 year old is going to be focused on and um, what they're really trying to dial in is going to be different than what a seven, eight or nine year old is going to be focused on. And these guys know how to do it better than anybody that I've seen. Um, just something for everybody out there who's curious about the sensor, you know, if you haven't heard of it, it's that little knob that you put on the end of your bat. It goes around, uh, attaches around the knob of your bat, uh, kind of just like a little latex cover. And inside that sensor, that blast motion sensor, if it's blinking orange or green, it's charged. If it's blinking red, it's dead. You pop it on that charger to, to get it going, and it lasts for eight hours of use. Um, so also from my five years of experience at Blast, something that I really haven't uh, been able to develop is patience, I guess I'd say, for people who show up to – coaches who give me excuses for players that show up to practice without charged sensors. So I don't think you'll be able to really convince Jordan or any of your instructors that you have a valid reason why you don't have a charged sensor. Um, but, you know, so Jeff, it's important I have to, to interrupt you for a second. I don't think you've seen it yet. Um, Chris and the team here not only built out these homemade incredible um, charging stations that I think charge eight blast sensors at a time. So not only can a player come in and charge their sensor if it's uncharged, and I will admit that we have some players who come in uncharged, but we we ordered a whole bunch of sensors that we have in the library. So if a player comes in with a sensor that is not charged, they borrow a sensor, slap it on their bat, we, we um, pair them, and theirs is charging, and they use it for the practice. We then swap back, they have a charged sensor, and we're good to go. So no... Uh, charging never gets in the way. And in the in the vein of uh, player success, we will not let somebody come in here and their senses uncharged and, and chastise them for it. Instead, it's don't worry, we've got you covered. Beautiful. Beautiful. All the more reason to uh, put you guys on that pedestal compared to everybody else. Appreciate that. Um, so as far as kind of what you're getting into with blast and, and what you're seeing on the app I, I want everybody to just keep in mind that first and foremost blast is a tool so um it's a tool that gives you um what's geez what's the word objectable insights into your swing i mean it's all it's measuring all things that really are common language when you're talking to the baseball or softball swing however you know we we put our own terminology for it and i've actually recently gotten to a little bit of a, of a debate with Jordan on how we name some of our metrics and uh, he's part of our advisory board. So I know he's got some, <laughs> some opinions on it, but uh, you know, swing plane is swing path. Rotational acceleration is how efficiently you can accelerate the bat. Bat speeds how fast you can swing it. Connections, your bat and body relationship. Um, but again, going back to the New York empire instructors and, and how they've been curious and asking questions and jumping on the calls with us. 
Um, that's what you guys got to do. So if you're curious about what's going on with your son or daughter's blast sensor or your, or your own blast sensor and your own swing, approach your coach and ask questions. Um, ask why they're going a certain direction with your swing. And I, you know, I know for a fact that those instructors are using these blast motion insights. It's not the end all be all solution. And uh, your, your New York Empire coaches know that. They know that it's considered in your overall development. Um, and again, there's no other organization that uses those tools uh, better than these guys. So um, with that, you know, I do want to make my team available to anybody who's part of, a, of the New York Empire organization. So you know, take, take, take those questions to your coaches. But I, I see a ton of people on this call. And if it if you think it would benefit you or your, or your son or daughter to hear it from the blast person to have a dive into metrics, to have us run some reports for you guys, to have you explain what's going on. We're absolutely happy to spend the time. Um, and again, that's a service that's included typically just for, for coaches uh, to have a main point of contact at blast to do things like webinars and dive into data and things like that. But obviously with uh, this, this great partnership we have with New York empire baseball, um, we're happy to make ourselves available to anybody and everybody who's a part of this organization. So, um, again, just keep in mind that this is a tool. There's a lot of things you can do to poke around in the app as well. I mean, you can have it suggest drills for you based on your deficiencies and uh, read, you know, list, watch videos or read what definitions of metrics are. And it's all, it's all fine and good, but your coaches are so involved. And it's such a unique opportunity you have here at New York Empire that your coaches are so involved. That if you do have questions about blast motion, you know, I under take take note of your metrics. Um, what's green? What's yellow? What's red? And then just start asking some questions to your coaches, and uh, they'll be able to pro provide that insight to you for sure. But um, if you want to get deeper, you know, I'm here. Um, our, our rep in the New York area is there. Uh, Jonathan Demarty and um, Stephen Coelho, your customer success rep out of Atlanta, I know is in the area fairly frequently, and you know, obviously we're always available remotely via webinar. So. That's amazing. Jeff, thank you for that. I'm, I I should, anytime I need something, I guess I should have you on a webinar because you just, that's like a, a Christmas in March. Um, I, I think maybe <laughs> it makes the most sense um, if I could take you up on that offer. I mean, that's a, thank you, Jeff. Um, maybe it makes sense uh, if you're a New York Empire baseball family and you want a deeper dive uh, into blast motion, whether as a whole um, or your own son's uh, metrics, and you want to hear from both Blast Motion's team and our team, uh, reach out to us, send us an email. And Jeff, maybe it makes sense to just set up one call and we'll have a small group on there for, for people who are really looking for the deep dive. Does that work for you? Totally. And another option is what we've also done is uh, whether in the middle of the day or in the evening, we can work out a time. We just have a conference bridge open and people can pour in and out of it. So it'll be two, three hours from, you know, maybe we'll do yeah, four to seven or something like that. And mm -hmm. If you want to log on and ask a couple of questions, you know, we might be in the middle of something, but still you can kind of listen in and um, we'll record that. And uh, that way you can even potentially get some one-on-one -on -one time and talk specifically about your son or daughter instead of just kind of a broad concept that touches the whole audience. So there's some options. So Jeff, if I remember the last time, and I'm thinking back, we've never done that except for one night. And I'm sorry to share this with everybody, but I'm not, because it was a, an amazing moment for us with Blast. We had a player named Julian. He's he's now a college bound ball player, hitting baseballs 100 miles an hour. Of course, um, there was some concern over early connection, Jeff, and bat speed. And when his early connection was less than optimal, his bat speed was highest. And your your biomech team got on a call with me. Uh, I, I think you know they're West Coast, right? So I think it was 11 o'clock our time, eight o'clock your you know their time. And they put the numbers together. We took a deep dive and they said he's showing numbers. And the reason they weren't concerned was because his his the relationships between his movements were identical to Shohei Otani. And <laughs> it, right, you could imagine what that phone call looks like the next day when you reach out to a 16-year-old kid who's worried about his early connection not being optimal and, and not being able to fix it. And we show him the side by side that your biomech team provided saying, hey, don't be concerned just yet. You you are mirroring and maybe at you know 25% lower uh exit velo. Uh you're mirroring Shohei Otani right now. That's that was a good phone call the next day. So we uh we certainly welcome the opportunity to to put our ball players in front of you and your team. So thank you for that. Uh I do want to make one more point kind of on that note. Um 
when you're looking at your blast metrics, don't concern yourselves at all with, with any colors. So this player, for example, I remember this, um, really concerned about uh, his high early connection and, and struggling to make adjustments and just concerned about how that might affect uh, his outcome. And that might have been where the, the best range for, for him is. So the only thing I would say also when you're, well, the other thing I'd say when approaching the blast metrics, give yourselves a baseline and make sure you're making improvements. And Jordan, I, th I think that you'd be fine with me saying, give your coaches at New York Empire a hard time if your bat speed's been 45 miles an hour for two years. <laughs> you know, like, what are your guys doing? So um, I'm sure that won't uh, that won't be the case, but that's essentially the the, the strongest use case of blast is hey if I'm going to be working on a certain area of my swing and doing and doing drills, um, I, I should be seeing an improvement in this area of the swing. So and that also goes back to the curiosity and asking questions and everything. But um, again, don't be so concerned with uh, your metrics being red or, or even yellow. Um, you can also use blast to know where you're going to be strongest and, and kind of where you're fitting and to understand your swing. Yep. So awesome. Jeff, thank you. Appreciate you that. Got it, Thanks, for, Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And you know, it's interesting. I, one of the reasons that we wanted to have blast motion involved in this call was because it, it takes us from this sense of empowering our players to, to own their development right into what we want to talk about next. Um, which is one of the common themes that came up in, in these player development scorecard calls. And in this program, uh, one of the most common things we heard was, will the coaches hold the players accountable, right? And look, what we are going to do, we're not going to punish somebody. Oh, you didn't do your blast motion homework today, or you didn't do your training homework. Well, there's no punishment. But if you don't improve, you'll have to understand that you're not putting in the work, right? We're here to help put in that work and do whatever we can to create programming that works for every player. But let's understand something very, very clearly. And this is not only going to take us from owning um, uh, the, the, the process of your own development and the journey, but also understanding that training leads to improved performance. Improved performance leads to, here we go, more playing time. Some of you asked, how does my son get more playing time? They improve their performance more playing time, better performance leads to where they sit for the next season and their own long-term development. And to understand that better, I know we talked about this uh, on our last call, but demonstrating proficiency in practice is what signals to a coach that a player is ready to play a new position, right? They're not going to get their first try at pitcher or first base or catcher in game. They're going to get that in practice, both indoors, outdoors, so that a coach feels that there's a level of proficiency. That doesn't mean that there's pressure on the player that if they make an error at first base, they're never going to play the position again. If the coach feels like there's a level of proficiency that warrants being in that position where there's no safety issue and there's not a sense where you're going to send a message to the rest of the team that why are we trying this player at first base? He, he's not he's not capable of playing the position very well. The onus is on us and the player to bring you to a, a baseline level of proficiency so that there's an interesting moment for you to come into a game, hopefully a low-pressure situation initially as a pitcher or a catcher, so that you can begin on or continue that road of development. It's not my how will my son ever learn to pitch if he doesn't pitch. You don't learn math by taking a math test. We're going to teach them the math. We're going to teach them the, the pitching, the catching, the first base, the hitting, and then put them in positions to succeed. Not throw them into the fire and say, let's see if he fails. We want to aid in their success. It doesn't mean we're going to guarantee their success. We're going to give them every opportunity and every tool to succeed. Right? So this rolls right into, of course, playing time positions, right? It's earned through that demonstrated performance, especially in practice. And again, when the coach feels confident, the player's ready, they're going to move them in. If a player has an interest in playing in a position where he doesn't seem to be getting looked at, please, as a parent, go to your son and say, go approach your coach and just say, what would it take for me to play first base? What do I need to learn to play shortstop? Not, I want to play first. What do I need to be doing to earn playing time at that position? If they don't like where they're batting in the lineup, Trust me when I tell you, it behooves the coach to put all the right pieces on the chessboard in the right places. 
it also behooves the coach to not have three guys that can pitch, but to have 12. So it's not that we want to focus, and this is where Devin Morgan is going to have a lot to say tonight. It's not that we want to ride three horses to victory and win some plastic trophies. We want to have 12 horses, 12 guys who can pitch, 12 guys who can play shortstop, 12 guys who can play first base, where they're not perfectly interchangeable, but every player is ready to be in a competitive situation. And that's a strange thing to say about what development is to some people, not to us. That's what development is. Developing all of the players on a team, eliminating the trailing tail of the bell curve, and not by cutting them off the team, but by moving them to the right on the curve, by making them better than they thought they could be. Will there still potentially be one or two players who are just clearly so fantastic, either through the, the talent and athleticism, plus the training and the hard work they put in? Absolutely. But wouldn't it be great to be on a team where numbers three through 13 are virtually indistinguishable in their level of talent instead of the usual travel baseball approach, which is three guys are really good. Six or eight guys are OK and maybe could play on the team and three guys fill out the roster. And I'll, I'm going to say it if that's the roster. Or if the roster then adds, and Devin, I'm, I'm going to kick it over to you here in a minute. If the roster then adds at 10U baseball or 12U baseball or even 14U baseball, something called a PO, that flies in the face of your child's development. No child. Jeff, I, if you're still on and you haven't muted, you, I heard you say at University of Pennsylvania, you played pitcher and infield. If somebody had made yep. you a PO at 12, you probably don't play college baseball. Maybe you get in as a pitcher, but you probably don't have much life there. Might have had less fun. That's it. <laughs> yeah. If you're a PO or there's a team out there from coast to coast that makes 12-year-old pitcher only, I don't know who that benefits other than the bank account of the organization. Shame on anyone who does that because it doesn't benefit the player. Does it benefit the team to add one more pitcher? Sure. At what cost? The future of that individual ball player. The answer is no. There's never a time that that player, unless there's some situation where for whatever reason, they don't want to do something. No way. If an 11, 12 year old ball player is told they need to be a PO, that's a money grab and has no business in developing young athletes and having them, Jeff just said it, have fun playing baseball for a really long time. I'm glad that Devin doesn't have his video on because the last time this topic came up, it not only did his face get real contorted, but we, we had some, some words that might be um, not suitable for work. Um, let's get into one more topic before we kick it over to Devin, because I, 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 I imagine he's brewing here um, at these topics. The most heard concern in, in these themes around player development in this program were my son is not as confident in the game as he is in practice. It's not uncommon, and we want you to understand where it comes from, why, and what we're going to do about it. And that's going to be virtually the topic for the rest of tonight. The challenge of going to cage to game is one of the toughest there is. First, understand that confidence is not something that gets turned on and off. You can't say, hey, be confident. That's right up there. Maybe number three behind just throw strikes and just make contact. Number three on the list of do not say, because it has no real value, is be confident. I can't be confident. I didn't study for the exam. I don't know what the teacher is going to ask, and I have no idea how this is going to go. That's not confidence. Saying you're prepared is cockiness. Knowing you're prepared is confidence. And knowing you're prepared comes from preparation. Okay? The other place that it comes from, and this is a prerequisite for performance. You could have the best swing. You and Jeff McGarry could have all the webinars you want with his team. You can use your blast all day. You could do all of our homework. If you are afraid of failure and afraid of judgment, whether it's the judgment of your peers, your teammates, your parents, your coaches, anyone, you will have trouble going from cage to game. You will not be as confident on the field as you are in the backyard, as you are in the cage, as you are on the beach. And after Devin speaks about this, we're going to come back to that topic 
very in depth around what we do in game, pre game, and in practice to get every player feeling as confident as they can be because they are free from judgment, free from fear of failure, and they're prepared. What we need to accomplish that is a uniform and consistent message and set of values from every coach, every trainer, every parent, and every member of every team in this organization so that you all understand that striking out is not that embarrassing. That rolling a 40 hopper to the second baseman is not good contact. Swinging as hard as you can with a great swing, that's a success. Because over time, it will lead to long-term success. And I think Jeff said it best, more fun. And the more fun you have playing baseball, the better you get, just like anything else in life. So with that, uh, at the risk of stealing any more of Devin's thunder tonight, um, I want to introduce, um, if he's not my favorite person in the industry, um, and Devin, I'm going to avoid the tears tonight, I swear. Um, he is my brother in this industry. Um We've done some really special things together, and he recently wrote a book that is an absolute game changer uh, for parents, for players, for coaches. Uh, it's called Skills That Scale, uh, the complete guide to coaching youth baseball and developing ball players. So uh, Devin Morgan, founder of the Driveline Academy, director of youth baseball, uh, welcome and thanks for being with us. Jordan, can you hear me just fine? Everything good? We can hear you great, Devin. Okay, Beautiful. Um, yeah, usually when Jordan and I do these type of talks, uh, I'm the one that like lo starts losing his mind and might say some words that might not be applicable for Sunday service. So um, I'm glad that Jordan's already like, you know, ripped the bandaid off there. Um, so for anybody that doesn't know, uh, again, I'm the director of youth baseball at Driveline. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know Driveline, uh, we've been doing player development at the professional collegiate and high school level since 2009. Um, we have... Uh, thousands of professional athletes that we've worked with, tens of thousands of college players, uh, a whole ton of high school kids and youth this whole time. Um, and I've been coaching youth baseball. I think this is going to be my 14th year, um, which uh, explains why my beard is rapidly graying uh, compared to some of the old content that I used to shoot when I first started working at Driveline. Um, I started at Driveline in 2018, um, started our youth department, started our academy initiative. Um and I think the thing that I could hopefully uh, be so bold is to to give you guys a little bit of perspective on is just why player development is actually important in youth baseball. Um, and I think a lot of this kind of comes to some of the stuff that Jordan's already touched on about how does player development fit in kind of the other end of the 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 stack, which is, hey, my my kid just wants to put on a uniform and play games and have fun. Um, so we got to start to think about the specific environment of youth baseball. Um, and, and I think it does bear to kind of, it's, it's beneficial to, to review some of these things because sometimes I think we can under, like there's some tacit acknowledgement. We understand these things to be true, but then you see your, ch your child on a field and sometimes some of that same consideration goes out the window. So youth baseball is a very specific environment with a specific composition of player and a very specific uh, physical dimensions. Um, obviously, kids are not small adults. Um, and what we're seeing in youth baseball is literally like children that are learning uh, a skill. They are learning uh, both the skills that comprise the game of baseball, and they are also learning the game of baseball itself. And those two things might develop on two different timelines for each child. Uh, relative to not only things that they might just be a little bit more inclined to and a little bit more maybe uh, regressive on and also just how they spend their time. Um, player development in youth baseball is really important because the physical environment of the game changes and it changes rapidly. Um, for a lot of our 12 and under kids, you're going to be playing specifically on a 60 foot baseball field with a 46 foot mound. Um, Best case scenario, um, you will be able to have that child transition from a 4660 field to something like 5070, uh, something like 5480 after that. But eventually, if we simply do the thing that I know that Jordan and I intend to do, and I think, well, I hope and I wish that everybody intended to, 
if you want a kid to play the game until they're around 14 years old, they are going to land on a 60, uh, 60 foot, six inch mound, 90 foot base configuration of baseball. Um, that's real baseball, right? And the problem is, is that that youth field in comparison to the 90 foot field, uh, the 90 foot field is somewhere between 280 and 335 percent larger, just in terms of total square footage than the youth field that comes before it. Um, this can be problematic if you kind of overemphasize the importance of skills that are uh, effective only in this small field environment, because as the field environment change, uh, again, this is an inevitable change that kids will have to deal with. Uh, the composition of the skills needs to change as well. The problem that we've seen over the last several years is that baseball, uh, as an industry, we don't do a great job of, I think, the scale of that transition from the small field to the big field. And we also don't do a great job of developing the skills that are necessary for that inevitably big field. Uh, and the result of that is, is pretty apparent. Uh, there's an organization called Aspen Institute, and through their Project Play initiative uh, for the last several years, they've been studying both youth participation and youth retention rates in sports. Um, those numbers are really bad on the baseball side. Uh, in the last year or so, uh, the 2022 numbers that just got released in 2000, at the tail end of 2023, uh, baseball uh, suffered the worst participation drop of any sport. Uh, we lost 20% of participants year over year. Um, the other trend that continued was the issue that we have in base, youth baseball, which is retention. Um, so basically what we're talking about retention, what we mean is the number of participants uh, and the difference in the number of participants between the ages of 6 to 12 and then between the ages of 13 to 17. And, well, what changes right around 13? Well, the field starts to get a lot bigger. So to me, uh, the fact that youth baseball uh, suffers not only these participation losses, but also the worst retention, uh, the worst retention numbers to the tune uh, of losing somewhere between around 1.6 to 1.8 million children every single year that stop playing baseball right around the age of 13. Uh, I think there's some pretty clear signal there that if these kids had fun playing baseball and they felt competitive enough to continue to play it, then why would they stop? Uh, but they are stopping um, and they are stopping playing again at a disproportionate rate compared to every other sport, specifically the major ones that baseball gets compared to uh, basketball, football, soccer. Um, so for us at Driveline, um, the importance of this idea of skills at scale is basically to combat that problem. Um, because I think at the end of the day, you can boil this down to a, a pretty simple concept. And some of this Jordan um, has, has, already, um, has already hit on, which is no great surprise because look, you know, New York Empire as an organization is one of those organizations. And there are not a, not a lot who, when I look at how they behave and I look at how their coaches are trained and I look at the way that they attempt to make their customers feel and I look at the type of experience they provide and the way that they focus on player development, they're doing it the right way. Um, so our intention with, again, this idea of skills at scale and our focus on player development, specifically in youth baseball, it kind of comes down to just like two very simple points. Number one, um, baseball has to stay fun. Uh, kids nowadays, Year of Our Lord 2024, have more options than they've ever had, basically at any point in human history. Um, and a lot of those options are on their phone, their games and video games with their friends, and it might be other sports. Um, but I think we're certainly losing a lot of other kids to uh, non-athletic opportunities. Um, I think team sports uh, are tremendously value for any child's development. I'm not going to be shy about that. I think it imparts... Um, a lot of things that are just beneficial to that person holistically that will uh, be evergreen for the rest of their lives because they're going to have to work on a team. They're going to compete. They're going to have to try to improve themselves. And I think team sports kind of functions as a container to teach some of those things to young kids. So if baseball is fun, then we should expect that these kids should be able to get those benefits of participation in a team sport if they continue to play. Uh, the second part of that is that if we understand that the composition of skills is going to inevitably change if we want to orient these kids for long-term success, meaning we want them to play this game further than the age of about 12, then because we don't have access to a time machine, we have to be pretty particular about the way that we spend our time. 
And for us at Driveline, specifically with our Driveline Academy teams, that means we are going to have some part of our year where we are going to spend a lot of time on skill development, and then we're going to start to kind of play games around that, um, which I think brings to mind, I think, the, the next thing that is really worth talking about, again, because Jordan talked about this before, is just for you, you guys as parents, you know, what's the value proposition of having your child in a on a club or a select baseball team? Uh, does that club or select baseball team effectively function only as a container to serve your child games and give them opportunity to put on a cap and a, a jersey and a belt? Or are they trying to do a little bit of both, which is develop the skills that you're going to need when you play the game and then go out and stress test those skills in competition? Um, I think uh, Jordan's uh, example of the... Uh, the math, you know, how you how kids learn math skills and how we think about kind of academic learning is absolutely appropriate. Um, the way that they teach in our schools is not give them tests five days a week, right? We introduce a skill, we acclimate them to that skill, we practice the skill, and then we test the skill. Um, the application of this idea in youth baseball is is pretty easy to understand. If the only thing that your traveler select baseball program does is gives you games all the time, you're just kind of exhibiting the skills that you already brought to the equation, which is different than having a set period of time where you can actually try to develop skills and then go see the see how those things work in competition. Um, so for us, this idea of, hey, you know, baseball has to stay fun. Okay, cool. What's How do we do that? Well, I'm not going to have youth baseball teams play a number of games that like a college baseball team wouldn't play. Um, unfortunately that is all too often getting to be a little common these days. Um, I also am on one of the ABCA youth committees with Jordan. Um, one of the talks that I did at our youth summit last year is, uh, you know, one of the things I referenced was two teams that I pulled up that are very highly rated in a perfect game, um, a nine U team and an 11 U team. First of all, uh, perfect game team ratings at the nine U level, uh, the 11 U level, uh, the 16 U level, uh, none of this really matters. Coaches at the next level, which meaning college coaches, do not care about these things. These coaches are not looking at kids' uh, win-loss record of their club team. Uh, I have yet to run into a high school coach that has asked a question of a child about how many games their club teams want. What high school coaches are looking for, what college coaches are looking for, is they're looking for dudes. They're looking for kids, and they're looking for kids that have skill. Um but for the slide that I referenced at our youth summit, uh, there was a 9U team and an 11U team who, uh, during the previous year, played a combined total of 173 games. Um, you know, I, I I tend to be a little bit hyperbolic about this stuff, and I guess I'll do that again. Uh, that number of games for those kids really disgusts me. Um, it's incredibly disappointing because there's no way that either one of those teams is doing that in a way where you know, they don't have 25 person rosters, right? They, they probably look the same way that a lot of other nine U and 11 U teams looks, which is you have like two or three horses that are going to throw the majority of those innings. Uh, and then the rest of the kids kind of get like mop up duty around that. And that cycle of behavior, not only uh, is misinformed because you are pining for rewards that literally no one cares about uh, other than, you know, the fact that like, hey, as a parent, I get a chance to post on Instagram that my kid won a plastic trophy. And I understand the keeping up the Joneses effect of that. Um, I'm also pretty confident that uh, no matter how many games my children are going to play this year, whether they win plastic trophies or not, I can do my job as a parent, not an administrator of my program, but as a parent to let them know that I love them regardless of how these games go. And I think that's going to help that kid impart a much healthier perspective on their participation in sport. Um but, but two, playing that number of games and effectively having the Traveler Club team function as the game delivery container is really putting these kids at very significant and serious risk of injury because there's no way that you can effectively distribute that type of workload. Um, so this is a very, very long-winded way and a long rant that I'm sorry that you guys have had to, to, to sit with for so long. That basically, I, I really want to highlight the importance of organizations like New York Empire who are trying to do the best at developing players and keeping youth baseball fun. Uh, it, it seems crazy that that should be something that is like, a, I guess, a, you know, like a, a big significant positive value proposition. 
but the reality of it is that it is. Um, I understand the the fascination and the focus with gameplay. When my kids were younger, all they wanted to do was play games, and I get it. Uh, I think what we tried to do is instead of playing tournament games every weekend uh, and neglecting opportunities to develop skill away from the game, uh, we just constantly competed. Um, you know, Jordan was just talking about uh, this idea of trying to go from cage to game. Uh, one of the easiest ways you can start to do that is make your practices more competitive, right? We're trying to construct a challenging, competitive, but safe environment for children to learn and stress test the skills that they've been developing so that when they get into competition and they actually have a cap and a belt on, they're competing no differently than they would when they're in a training environment. Um, so yeah, baseball, youth baseball should be fun. It should be developmentally focused. It shouldn't look like a math class where you're taking tests five days a week. Uh, I know that's what we strive for at the Dryland Academy. That's the approach that we advocated for in our skills at scale complete youth baseball training manual. Uh, and it's definitely something that, uh, you know, again, uh, New York Empire is not uh, is not one of a lot of organizations that have this approach. They are one of few, which is why uh, Jordan and I have such a great relationship. We have such a good kinship because we are on the same page about what we're trying to do and why. And look, at the end of the day, uh, some of these kids are going to ideally play baseball long enough and they're going to be done at high school. And that's OK. Um there aren't, you don't have a mechanism to create more roster spots in college. Uh, my job is really, really clear at driveline. I want the kids in my program to have the opportunity to have a four-year high school baseball career. Uh, that's it. That's, that's really simply the thing that we advocate for. Um, past that, if we want to open up the door for some of these next level play opportunities, if you haven't developed skill, you are going to be that parent that's on a Facebook travel ball forum who's going, you know, my kid gets outs and he throws like 72, 74. And I don't understand why college coaches want to talk, don't want to talk to him. Uh, they don't want to talk to your child and not interest in giving that kid an opportunity because that kid is one of like 300,000 other kids that missed opportunities to develop skill and get ahead of that curve. And once you get stuck behind it, it's really hard to make up that ground. So Jordan, apologize. That was a really, really long rant. My bad. Um, if if that's a rant for which <laughs> you think you need to apologize, uh, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself, and uh, you can continue to rant away because, I mean, you, you are a beacon and, and a leader in this industry for a reason. Um, appreciate um, the love that you share, but uh, I really the the trail that you blazed for certainly for us. Uh, and for every child that will ever walk through our doors it is forever appreciated, Devin. I appreciate you, brother. Always. Uh, any, anything that I missed? Anything else you want to, I should well, Devin, go off on about? What? It's funny. Somebody on our staff uh, went on the chat and sent a link that we're going to share. I didn't think we we're going to do that. But since you just said it, I'm going to go ahead and share it. Uh, folks, we're going to share a link to uh, a private event that Devin and I did on behalf of the folks uh, at Uplift Labs and Strategy Red Sports uh, and League Apps, uh, we spoke to some of the largest organizations in the country um, about just these topics. And, you know, Devin presented some very emotional um, moments. I, I shouldn't say moments, right? The crux of the whole book, Devin, is emotional, even though it says it's a complete guide to, to, to youth baseball. Um, it's a very emotional tome about what it takes to be a successful coach and all we did, Devin, was dovetail off of your work and share how we go ahead and implement uh, the concepts behind skills that scale. Uh, so we're going to go ahead. It's in the chat right now. That is a link to a, a private event that that Devin and I did at the uh, American Baseball Coaches Association. Um, for uh, it's certainly, as far as I'm concerned, it's worth watching. But if if the things that that Devin said here tonight um, sat well with you or resounded or or just sparked some interest. Uh, and, and Devin, if you missed anything, I think we may have edited out the stuff that was inappropriate. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure the the moment where you uh, blew your top uh, about things like POs and, and other things uh, disappeared from it very conveniently. So that's that's fair. Uh, right. You know, the, the only other thing I would offer is just, you know, if I take off my um, my program director um, professional hat. 
you know, at the end of the day, I just had the fortune slash misfortune of having a couple kids who loved baseball as much, if not more than I did. And I remember when, you know, they were seven, eight years old and I was very overly emphatic about the need for us to win every game. Um, I remember when they were 12 years old and I was still, you know, trying to wrap my head around the correct perspective that I should have as a parent about my kid's sport competition. Cause at the end of the day, you know, I, I think Jordan, you and I are no different than this. Like my, my biological imperatives, I, I, I need to keep my children safe. And when I saw them fail and I saw them fail publicly as a parent, it made me feel really uncomfortable because that's my child and I love them and I want to save them from whatever, you know, hardship, struggle or failure that, that I went through specifically in this game. Cause I got run out of baseball by a bad coach. And I think a lot of that has to do with why I'm so passionate about it today. Um, but now, you know, I have a 17 year old daughter who is done with baseball, but she's done with baseball because she chose to be done. And I think a lot of the approaches that we learned in baseball, specifically through this lens of player development, where you're just competing against yourself and you're just trying to get better than you were today than you were the day before. And this idea that just, you know, hard work gives you honesty. This is very much Casey Weathers, uh, driveline OG trainee 101. Um, she is a cheerleader uh, part of the year and she's a wrestler the other part of the year. So all she does all year is just like throw girls in the air, whether that's in wrestling or whether that's in cheer. Um, <laughs> And, you know, and, and my son um, is, is still playing. He just had his high school baseball tryout, made a JV team. All the seniors are joking that he uh, they're calling him snub because he got snubbed from varsity as a freshman. Um, you know, he he throws the ball 85 miles an hour at 15. He hits balls 90. And as, as Jordan knows, it's not like I supplied him with some sort of elite genetic contribution to that. He is a result of two things. He is incredibly passionate about this game in a way that, like, to, to, to be honest, is really scary because I know how difficult it is, it, it is if he's going to continue to play. He's also a result of hard work within a system of player development. And all of these choices that we've talked about, about how we spend our time, how you extract value from the club or, uh, club or select organization that you're part of, um, it can result in some pretty special training outcomes. Um, so at our Driveline Academy right now, we, we have what's called our 90-mile-an-hour army. We have around 25 kids that are 15 U or younger that have already hit a ball 90 or better. Um, that group we have created because those kids have been incredibly consistent over years uh, with training in this system. Uh, and we're not, it's, it's not just cage swing, you know, these kids can play the game too. Um, so, so to Jordan's point previous about, you know, whether, uh, player development and comp competition, you know, go hand in hand. Yes, I absolutely am convicted about the fact that they do. Uh, we 1000% intend to raise a, a generation of killers. They're going to go out and crush in this game. But the mechanism by which we're going to do that, the way that we spend our time and the actual time in which we want to go win is really important. I don't care about optimizing and taking the most optimal game theory path to winning games on a small field. I know what that strategy looks like. It involves taking the bat out of your kid's hands. It involves telling that kid to just throw strikes and they are going to optimize for accuracy at the expense of output. That's not the way that this game goes. The men and women that are very good at this game at a higher level, they pair these two things together. Children, because of a tremendous amount of physiological variability, nonlinear growth, all sorts of stuff, developing coordination, proprioception, whatever. I can throw all my $5 words at it, right? Kids aren't small adults. So if you're going to train them in this very specific idea of skills at scale, you may have to have some amount of tolerance for failure, if that's what we're going to call it, in the interim. But I assure you that... Uh, this is very much just like if you understand compounding interest and you understand that concept of I'm not going to try to get rich and retire because I hit the lottery, but I'm going to try to retire because I've made sound financial decisions, putting my money in the right place. That's the way that we approach skill development. That's what we're trying to do with our skills at scale program. That's trying to do with, I think, our academy teams. And, and I think, again, you know, Empire is just one of us very, very, very small number of organizations that actually care enough about your child to not only be mindful about the experience and the fun that they have now, but to set them up for long-term success, because that's the thing that they're actually going to remember. I won 
some games when I was younger, the games that I actually remember winning, weirdly enough, are the ones that happened when I was much older as a player. Amazing. Devin, thank you. And thank you for being with us tonight. Always. Anytime, brother. And, and amazingly, you, 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 you dovetailed right into this next uh, discussion we want to have about competition. And then I said it earlier, and I think you said it better than I did. Competition and development are just not mutually exclusive, right? There are some programming. Look, we, we trained a boy last night who we're actually going to post him on, on social tomorrow um, around um all the lessons that he takes and this team he plays on in New Jersey and the team says, Oh, you know, we're going all these tournaments, but we're a developmental team and they're just not very good. And they're not very good at development. So that's just a, a cover for losing baseball games badly for us. That's not the case for us. Developmental means we want every player to get better for the long run. And we're not going to ride one or two or three horses to success as measured by plastic trophies, right? It's just, it's not what we're interested in doing. Um, you know, I, I think it short changes uh, all the other children on the team, right? So from there, um, understand that during the game, and I'm glad that Chris Carano has joined us, um, during the game, as he likes to point out, the, the players want to win the game. It's, it's, it's a driving factor in, in what they're doing, right? So the goal, in that two hour span is to go out, do the best you can with what you've learned, what you've trained, what you've done. And if you do, and you outdo what the other team does, much of which you can't control, you will win more games, but you may not. There may be games that you lose because the other team scores more runs. We've thrown a one hitter where we got seven or eight hits that day. We lost the game one nothing. The one hit our pitcher gave up, who is now going on to play college baseball, was a home run, line drive to left field. We lost one nothing. The other team had a phenomenal um, center fielder, tracked down everything, kept us from scoring by himself. We lost one nothing. Was that a success or a failure, right? We've, we've talked about this, right? Um, so the goal of the game is to win. So you're not like, like I said earlier, when you're not going to see everyone playing shortstop in the course of a game, people have to earn playing time, right? So that's the reward for combining the passion and the hard work that Devin, uh, so rightly spoke of, right? There, there's something else I want to talk about when it comes to player development competition and development and, and, and how you go about all this. Some people have said to us at different levels of baseball, well, we don't need this. My son's not going to be the next Derek Jeter. Ha ha. That badly misses the point. As Julian Melinda uh, on our staff is, is so apt to point out, if your bar is only whether or not you're going to be a first ballot unanimous Hall of Famer, and since you're not going to be that, you might as well not work hard. You, I, I love the way he says it, right? He, he's a ball player himself. You've missed the point. You get to learn the correlation between hard work and success. You get to own your own development and take responsibility for addressing your weaknesses. Those things play on in life, on and off the field. And the other things you'll learn in addition to the rest of the values that, that our organization holds so dear and, and, and is truly woven into the fabric of everything we do are the values of hustle and hard work and teamwork and responsibility and resiliency. Those aren't limited to the baseball field. It's why so many people say that baseball is a metaphor for life. It may be a team sport, but you can't pass. And I will tell you from my own experience and from now watching thousands of young ballplayers over a 15 year span, you wanna know what lonely feels like until you've been on a pitcher's mound and you can't throw strikes while really well-intentioned people are yelling nothing more than just throw strikes, you don't know what lonely is. When you feel helpless on a pitcher's mound and you're not coming out, you know what lonely feels like. You can't pass. Nobody's coming to save you. It's an incredible metaphor for life. So whether or not your son will be the next Derek Jeter is missing the point. It's learning life lessons through baseball and also becoming an extraordinary ball player in the process, right? None of this is an excuse 
for not winning more plastic trophies or competing at a higher level because I could tell you now, and we we had a webinar a couple of years ago, um, tail end of COVID, where we had some of our you know alumni athletes, and and on this screen is is just a list, although one of them is spelled wrong, um, of of some of the schools at which. New York Empire baseball alum, and I'm not talking about somebody who showed up here and moonlighted for a tournament because we just don't do that. Players who trained here and learned here and developed here and some of whom coached here for years are at Dartmouth, Duke, Maryland, Yale, Carleton with an E, Hamilton, McAllister, and other schools. Those are the most recent that came to mind when we were writing this. That's where our ball players go on to play baseball and succeed at extremely high levels. I think the joke about Devin Milberg is that he's the, the only player, and I don't know if it's verified. Devin, you're going to love this. The only player in the history of baseball with an, an SAT over 1,500 and a slider spin rate two times his SAT score. If that's not the most extraordinary stat in the history of uh, uh, um, academic athletes, I, I I don't know what is so or student athletes. So, Devin uh, Milberg, we love you. Uh, we love what you represent, but um, understand that that comes from lessons learned that will help you succeed on and off the field. And to Devin's point, avoiding failure is not the goal. As 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 righteous as that that may be, as a a parent, you you don't want your child hurt. I I think I've heard people say that. It, being a great parent doesn't mean you you stop your children from from failing. It, it means you help them understand how to come back from their failure, right? And you know, I think we said um, not long ago for those of you as parents who don't want to admit, and those of uh, our ball players who have shared that they're embarrassed when they swing and miss, embarrassed when they strike out, embarrassed when they walk a play or give up a home run. I always ask this, I say, are you willing to trade a moment or a day of embarrassment for a lifetime of success? And if you're not willing to make that trade, I'm I'm going to say something inappropriate, something's wrong. And I get it. Embarrassment's not fun. Loneliness is not fun. But a lifetime of, of development, improvement, and long-term success, I would make that trade every day. That brings us to something that's going to surprise you. It's written there in red. After all that you've heard tonight, you're not going to believe that our in-game approach is these three words. Win every pitch. Understand what we mean by that. If you are at bat, and Maxwell Lincoln said it best, every pitch is a chance, his words, for me to hit a home run. He didn't say every at bat. He didn't say every game. He didn't say every season. Every pitch. I've told this story over and over and over again. 11U baseball, Maxwell is playing for me. He took one called strike in a season. He also struck out one time that season. It was the same at bat. Every pitch was a competition. And that's true whether you're a hitter, a pitcher, or you're playing any other position, or even if you're on the bench. How do you win as a left fielder? Nobody on, nobody out, ground ball to second. You move over to left center field to back up a possible uh, uh, error that goes into right field. The right fielder throws to second base. He overthrows second base, and you're waiting for it. That's how you win that pitch as a left fielder. How do you win sitting on the bench besides eating big league chew? You're paying attention to outfielders throwing a baseball. So that when you get into the game, you know that the left fielder doesn't have a very good arm. So on a base hit to left field, you got a good chance of scoring from second base. If you don't know that, it means you weren't paying attention on the bench. So every at-bat is a series of competitions, whether you're the pitcher, the hitter, or any other position on or off the field. So you need to win those games within the game. Every pitch is a competition. Every pitch is a game. And every play made is a game. Right? A ground ball is a very simple game. Can the batter turned runner beat the infielders from getting the ball to first base before he gets there? That's a game within the game. It's the way that we run our practices. It's the way that we run some of our training. And if you win the games within the game, you're likely to win the whole game. 
What's a parental responsibility in game? Watch, but don't coach. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. Number two, no, this is not a discussion on golf in, in, in the Middle East. Do not initiate the post-game analysis. We have a player who is a pitcher. Um, I don't want to say who it is because it might hurt some feelings. He's a college pitcher right now who said over and over and over he wanted to quit baseball, and I've been training him since he's nine years old, and he never shared that with me until recently. And I know he's on this call tonight. I said, why? He said, because every time my dad drove me home, it was a post-game analysis, and I begged him to stop to the point where I wanted to stop playing baseball. Kid now is a left-handed pitcher who looks like a physical specimen and has more passion than, than I do for this game. And I'm glad he didn't quit. So what you can do as a parent is share this one thing. I love watching you play. And if a ball player says, but dad, I struck out three times, that's okay. I just love watching you play. I know as a parent that that's how I feel about my children. If my daughter doesn't score too many goals in soccer, I am actually, I'm not counting the goals. I'm counting how fast she runs, how much effort she puts in, and how much fun she's having. And I don't know how you measure units of fun, but when I get hugs and kisses and smiles, I know good things are happening. And when she asks me for something, I'm there for it. If she asks me to do things for her. I say, no, I will help you do them for yourself. There are different strokes, different, different ways to skin that cat. There's not one right way to parent children, but initiating a post-game analysis and coaching your child and yelling instructions during an at-bat is not a successful approach. And it certainly has no place in our organization. And take a break from that because I know some of you are waiting for some of the season details. Um, some of this will be disappointing news. For those of you who have been in the organization, the, the leagues don't publish their schedule. I mean, I was on the phone with the Parks Department for an hour today. They haven't released all of the permits to all of the teams and leagues and, and everything. Um, so the, the the leagues typically don't release their actual final schedule till late March. Some of them have said they won't have until the first week of April. They're probably setting a low bar. Um so we we won't have a, a full season schedule until the end of March. Keep in mind, we choose some of the, the leagues that we do because they're reliability of fields competition and sticking to a schedule. We have specifically not gone into leagues that might have good competition, but every Wednesday they send out the weekly schedule. I, I don't know how you as parents or me as a parent would ever manage around that. It sounds great. Oh, we're playing this team and that team and this team played this tournament and that team played that tournament. But we don't know our schedule except for week to week. I don't know how you manage a family not knowing when you're playing until each Wednesday. So we do not choose those leagues. Um, that being said, we, we do know we're going to start playing baseball on April 6th outdoors, weather permitting, of course, uh, we're planning a special event with the folks at Lasorda legacy park for most of our teams. Uh, the teams that are too young for that will play uh, intra-squad and inter-squad games uh, here in, here in the city. Um, understand that all locations will be throughout Brooklyn, Queens and Nassau. We are in two separate leagues this season based on where we thought was best fit for our teams. Um, look, on the one hand, we do want to stay as close as we can to home because there's probably not a correlation between uh, sitting in a car ride and becoming better at baseball. But if we feel like the, the competition and the experience will be better 40 minutes away rather than 23 minutes away, we're going to travel 40 minutes. Um, understand that a lot of Long Island based and even Queens based teams don't want to come into Manhattan. They, to them spending what was it? Sixty three dollars next to Central Park. Sixty three dollars to park a car is actually not normal to the rest of the world. Um, we think it's perfectly normal, you know, and you just go on Spot Hero and save six bucks and you feel like a champ. Um, so typically they don't like it. So one of the things uh, the Parks Department has been a tremendous um uh, sort of uh, i guess inadvertent source of support for the organization they know how many teams we have they know exactly how many players we have across every division in the organization we've shared that with them so that we can have permits and fields that are appropriate for our teams and just today they issued a series of permits throughout queens for us to make it more palatable for teams outside of manhattan to play baseball with us and against us some of the other teams in Manhattan probably don't belong in travel baseball. So we have skipped out on some of the local travel leagues. Um, we are definitely going to a tournament Memorial Day weekend in Long Island. 
Again, we have a, we're planning a one day event April 6th in Long Island and the rest we will wait to hear from uh, the leagues with their schedules um, starting in April. And we, we should have those schedules at the very end of March. Um, understand a couple of things as we head into some of the more logistical details, um, arrival and, and the post game, they're not optional. We'll talk about that. So on, uh, on your schedule, you'll see that you're asked to arrive 45 minutes or one hour prior to game time for a very set planned routine of pregame warmup and preparation. Um, we also post game, have a team meeting and team packing and departure. The team comes and goes as a team. We understand that you all drive somewhat independently, but we do not leave a field one-off because you need to get to brunch. I understand. I got it. But if the, the game had gone five more minutes, you'd still be there. So please be respectful of the team, the coach, the other players to not run out. If you do have a situation where you need to leave early, please just communicate that to Jake and, and, and Chris and the coaches ahead of time so that we can have the team understand why a player is not there for a team meeting, why a player is not there for both games. We want to be as transparent as we can with the players because they deserve that respect. Some fun do's and don'ts. Um, fun might have been a euphemism for what it really is. Um, one, uh, and, and Jake was instrumental in keeping this as crisp as it can be, arrive early with players packed, carrying their own gear to the field, and expect to leave when the team leaves in its entirety. Uh, this says keep team snap available. We have since uh, moved all of functionality over to league apps, thanks to those folks for, for a really good solution. So keep your league apps availability updated and commute communicate changes not only on league apps, but if you have a last minute change where your child will not be at a baseball game, please reach out to your coach or Jake to let them know so that the coach can be prepared. The team can be prepared to play ball. We don't want to be worried an hour before game time, 30 minutes before game time, 20 minutes before game time, that something bad has happened, right? We want to know ahead of time so that we can plan appropriately. Um, if there is a concern uh, about playing time, positions, uh, a player had a, a bad experience, a good experience, something you want to share, reach out to the entire coaching staff, the player development staff with any opportunity that you think uh, we can be helpful with. Um, and, and remember to tell every child in this organization you love watching and play, uh, unless you don't, in which case, send your spouse, because they probably do. Um, the don'ts, and these are fun. Fun. Um, don't arrive at game time. Skip the warm ups because you you think that they're not important because your child's already warmed up because he ran from Fruit Loops to the car. Um, don't leave at the last out because you you have plans. Please just be respectful of the team and and what goes into the 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 culture of this organization. You know, a significant part of our experience is the preparation teamwork that is taught before, during, and after the game. Next, and this is a no brainer, but let's stick to it. Do not shout instructions during the game. Don't tell a player to keep their eye on the ball. That's probably not why they swung and missed. If you want to know more about that, happy to have a very deep dive webinar on why players swing and miss. Don't ask them to just throw strikes or make contact. They are capable of far more than that. And please don't reward a player for taking a pitch and say good on. Half the time, it's self-preservation. They got out of the way of being hit by a pitch. They did not have a good eye. They were saving their own life. We also are not excited about players taking close pitches. We'd rather they swung at them and hit them over outfielders' heads. Don't sit or stand near or behind the dugouts or backstops at any time throughout the game. If you want to share something with a player, bring it to the coach or give it to them before or after the game. Do not bring hot dogs into a dugout during a game. True story. Please, the players have worked so hard all winter long. They're going to continue to work hard in the spring. Let them perform just as they've prepared free of, free from distractions, right? Also uh, about player positions, the batting order, or anything other than a safety or health concern, don't approach the coach during the game. His 100% attention is on your children. Give him that respect and courtesy. And if you have something that you want to discuss, you have all of our information. Reach out. We are as transparent and open to conversations can be, but allow every coach to do what they do best, which is coach your children. Um, finally, we talked about, it, I don't want to get into it because it's very, very emotional. The post-game analysis is not necessary. If a player wants to talk to you or your son wants to talk to you about something, be an open, be, be there for them. But don't initiate after that. And look, true story. We had a player go three for four. We congratulated him. And he said, well, it stinks because my dad only wants to focus on the one thing that I, the, 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 the out that I made and the error I made at third base when I had my best hitting game ever. 
And, and that's just one sad story. We had another player named Matthew, not in the organization. Now this is years ago, who played a phenomenal game. Coaches went over. I mean, just off the charts. All the coaches went up. This player, congratulations. I think he threw a one hitter, had a couple of hits. And he said, wow, Matt, great game. And he said, yeah, that's because my dad wasn't here. And this has uh, got to be seven years ago. Okay, so uh, just be there for them. Just enjoy their success with, with them. And quite frankly, you can even enjoy in the process and sometimes the failure and just be there for them. Um, again, this is sort of repetitive. No parents on the field, not be on the backstop, not in the dugout at any time. We, every one of us, in addition to being uh, driveline certified and blast motion certified as first aid CPR AED certified and concussion trained by the, the folks at NYU concussion. Um, we will reach out to you as needed. Um, setting up your chairs on the foul line, not cool. Give the players a few feedback. So there's no safety concern on the dugouts, foul lines. Um, they need to be safe and unobstructed. Um, and I think we may have said it six or seven times here, even during their at bat or they're catching, you want to get video. no, do not go behind the backstop to take video. If you need us to be looking at something, just ping us, let us know. We'll be there for you. Um, understand that the players will be instructed to hang their bag in the dugout prior to the start of the game. Take care of their hat and bat bag. Do not come in the dugout to, to help them with that. They're going to learn here how to be responsible for their own stuff. Uh, if you look on our Instagram page from years ago or Facebook, there's a picture of a young boy carrying his beach chair um, out in the Hamptons and mom reached out to say, thanks, New York Empire Baseball. My son now carries the family beach stuff um, out here. So understand that this uh, this has far reaching repercussions, including cleaning their, their room at home. Uh, finally, please don't shout instructions during the game, you know, where to run, where to, when to stop. We understand you want to turn a double into a triple. And I may be speaking very specifically about a moment that we shared in Long Island. Um, we understand that a triple is cooler than a double, but if the coach is telling him no, 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 and you're yelling, go, 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 or yes, yes, please don't let the coaches coach, right? It leads to performance anxiety, confusion. Let the coaches be the one voice for the children on the field. Um, with that, um, I want to thank you all, um, for being such an incredible part of this organization for helping us to learn uh, every day, for helping us to evolve, um, for helping us to be fortunate enough to be with your children every day. It is an absolute, I know I speak on Chris BF Jakes and, and, and the rest of our entire coaching staff. This is all we do every day. We are not moonlighting coaches. Every one of our coaches is here full-time. This is all we do. Um, I can tell you on behalf of this entire coaching staff that we feel lucky to be doing it. Um, and sharing that all with you. So thank you. Have an awesome night. If you have questions that didn't get answered in here, send us an email, empire at newyorkempirebaseball.org. Obviously, Chris and Jake are, are on top of these things, and I'm happy to answer. And if you want to set up a deeper dive into driveline blast motion or anything else that goes on here, feel free to reach out and ask for it. We'd love to do it with you. So with that, have an awesome night. Uh, we look forward to seeing uh, our ballplayers here in the arena and all of our families over the next few days and weeks. And uh, look forward to hearing those two magic words in just a couple of weeks. Play ball.